If you've watched some of the other explainers in this series, you may be curious to see what kind of procedures are performed in nuclear medicine. Here's 11 common procedures performed in nuclear medicine. The bone scan is used most commonly. It can be used for checking for metastatic spread to the bone in prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, lung cancer, melanoma, for example. It can be used for assessing prosthetic joints like hips and knees, um, looking for infection or loosening. And it can be also used in athletes, um, young or old, looking for stress fractures, um, trauma, as well as um, shin splints. Other diseases include degenerative changes, vascular changes, benign tumours, as well as metabolic disease. Heart scans are also common nuclear medicine procedures. Here you can see a myocardial fusion scan under stress showing a defect with the arrow that under resting conditions has no defect. So this is um, stress-induced ischemia associated with coronary artery disease. You can also do a number of other types of scans, including for heart failure, amyloid, cardiomyopathy, congenital changes. And some of the state-of-the-art things that we do is providing co-registration between our myocardial fusion scan and our coronary artery blood flow studies um, using angiography. One of the emergency procedures done in nuclear medicine is a lung scan looking for pulmonary embolism. On the right, you can actually see the arrows pointing to perfusion defects associated with blood clots in the lungs, where there's no abnormality on the ventilation on the left. This is associated with pulmonary embolism. Another simple test done in nuclear medicine is the thyroid scan, simply looking at the amount of uptake in the thyroid, um, which indicates thyroid function. A number of diseases, including hot and cold nodules, Graves' disease, which is overactive thyroid, um, autonomous functioning nodule, which is also overactive thyroid, and of course the algoiter, which you can actually see there on the far left. There are a number of types of renal scans we do. One common one is for looking for pyelonephritis and scarring associated with urinary tract um, reflux and infection. Uh, this indicates, as you can see with the arrows, that the right kidney is not functioning as well as the, the left kidney and may guide surgery. Of course, we can actually look at clearance through the kidneys, um, looking for obstruction, as you can see here in the, um, in the right kidney, uh, with the curves where we can quantitate those studies to actually show the upward movement um, rather than clearing out like the white line. You can see the orange line continues to move upward after Lasix is given that indicates the patient has obstruction. There are a wide variety of studies of the gastrointestinal system, um, including transit studies, the esophagus, the stomach, the colon. Here you can see the transit through the stomach, um, which we can then quantitate. Um, and by quantitating it, similar to the renal scan, we can actually look at clearance and calculate the clearance rates from the stomach in this case, or other structures like the esophagus or colon. And of course, gastrointestinal bleeding studies are also performed in an emergency manner. And looking at the arrow here, you can see where the patient is bleeding. Biliary and liver scans are also very important. Um, here we can give a trace that's eliminated via the liver and the biliary system. Uh, in this case, there's no gallbladder, which would indicate cholecystitis. We can give morphine augmentation, which differentiates acute from, acute from chronic cholecystitis. Of course, we can quantitate that, um, drawing regions of interest around a gallbladder that does exist and giving the patient a fatty meal or the equivalent uh, in medication and actually quantitating how the actual gallbladder empties uh, looking at um, clearance. Brain scans are done in general nuclear medicine with SPECT as well. Here you can see a patient with epilepsy. Ictal means during seizure and you can see the hot spot with the arrow that's not there during the interictal phase, which is when there's no seizure. The scan on the top right shows similar things and it's not uncommon for the MRI scan to be normal. Of course, we can do other things. Here's a, a patient with um, uh, ischemia of the brain, transient ischemic attacks associated with a stress test of the brain using Diamox. There's a huge range of um, different studies that we perform in cancer. This one is uh, looking at um, breast cancer using a radiopharmaceutical. You see the breast cancer there with the arrow. And of course, uh, the same radiopharmaceutical can be used to show parathyroid adenoma uh, using a simple protocol uh, with a washout scan. So you can see between 15 minutes and two hours, the adenoma becomes obvious. 
And a really important test we do is looking at the sentinel nodes or identifying the sentinel nodes in breast and melanoma patients, as well as other kinds of cancers, um, where the arrows show the sentinel node versus the injection site to guide the surgeon. Whole body scan, I mean, with a patient with Hodgkin's disease, we can also use gallium 67s for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a really important type of scan. And of course, brain tumors, um, as you can see on the bottom left there, um, using normal nuclear medicine for doing uh, brain tumor studies. For PET scans, um, FDG or radioactive glucose is the most common um, tracer being used. It's used for, for brain imaging. You can see here, patient with Alzheimer's disease with uh, changes in glucose metabolism compared to a normal patient. It's also used in tumours because glucose is over metabolised in tumours. And so you can see a whole body scan here with a, a range of, of tumours spread to different parts of the body. And of course, it's used in the heart for metabolism um, when there's um, severe uh, ischemia. So it actually allows for assessment of myocardial viability. But PET scans are also done with other radiopharmaceuticals, including receptor imaging. So here's a dementia patient with Alzheimer's disease. Um, where we're actually using a new peptide um, called amyloid or beta amyloid imaging. Um, and that allows a different kind of test that is a bit more sensitive. Um, we can also compare our traditional FDG with um, receptors, with dotatate receptors, which are somatostatin receptors. And you can see the difference between the FDG or the glucose distribution and the receptor. And then we can refine that further, uh, the image on the far right, where we use a copper-based um, radio tracer for receptor imaging. And of course, there's a wide array of therapies that we undertake in nuclear medicine, um, including examples here that where we're using iodine-131 in thyroid cancer. It can also be used for hypothyroidism. Uh, we can do palliation of painful bone metastases. Um, there's an array of studies that we, therapy studies that we can do with um, um, Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example. Um, here we can actually see um, somatostatin receptor therapy with um, lutetium-177, and you can see the improvement over a period of 12 months um, with those arrows um, with disease in the liver. We've also developed um, newer traces that are alpha emitters as well as the, the original beta emitters. And here you can actually see PSMA in prostate cancer um, improve the outcomes um, using actinium-225 over lutetium-177. It should be kept in mind that there's hundreds of nuclear medicine procedures that we do in nuclear medicine using SPECT and PET and CT combined with our radiochemistry to provide molecular level insights. These procedures and, and insights are not available elsewhere. And of course, it's really important to know that um, this presentation has only given you a snapshot, a small snapshot of what's um, available. Here's an example of uh, infection imaging uh, using white cell labels, combining SPECT as well as the CT. So if you're interested in nuclear medicine or a career in nuclear medicine, you can start your nuclear medicine career at CSU, local innovation and global leadership.